on world air soon. Strategic destruction. Russia targets one of the world's largest grain storage facilities in an effort to bring down Ukrainian offensives. Tight race. Trump and Biden's new polls show a tense road ahead for the two candidates as ratings stand still between them. Lethal raids. A police outlawed in Brazil turns deadly with dozens losing their lives in the name of gang control. Voyage to Middle Earth. Soccer fans take a journey back to Middle Earth to browse props and costumes used in the making of the Lord of the Rings trilogy. This is Other There in a World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Sanuvi Mudanayaka. Good evening and you are watching World News. As we begin, the war in Ukraine yet again took a hit at global food security as Ukraine's coastal region of Odessa was rattled by Russian drones which hit grain storage facilities. An inland port across the Danube River was the main target of Moscow's drone attack, about 40,000 tons of grain destined for African nations, China and Israel were damaged as a result of the attack. Russia attacked Ukraine's main inland port on the Danube River on Wednesday. The strikes pushed up global food prices as Moscow ramped up its use of force to prevent Ukrainian grain exports. Video released by Ukraine's Southern Operational Command showed ruined port buildings in Ismail, in the Odessa region. The attacks forced ships to halt and drop anchor as they prepared to dock and load up with Ukrainian grain, in defiance of a de facto blockade Russia reimposed in mid-July. Ismail has since served as the main route for Ukraine's grain exports. Photographs released by the Ukrainian prosecutor's office showed at least two wrecked silos. This wasn't able to verify their location or date. There were no immediate reports of casualties. Russia has relentlessly attacked Ukrainian agricultural and port infrastructure since reintroducing the blockade. Kiev says its aim is to persuade shippers and their insurance companies that Ukrainian ports are unsafe to resume exports. Two industry sources told us operations at the port were suspended. The United Nations has warned Russia's decision to abandon the grain deal, brokered by the UN and Turkey, could cause a food crisis and hunger in the world's poorest countries. The environmental campaign group confirmed that the Greenpeace protesters draped the private home of British Prime Minister Rishi Sonak in black fabric to protest against his government's energy policy. Footage posted by Greenpeace UK showed protesters atop the property, covering it with sweats of black fabric, while two others held a banner that read, Rishi Sonak, oil profits or our future. Sonak Sofit had no immediate comment. Sunak said that he was going on holiday that evening. Britain adopted the target of reaching net zero carbon emissions by 2050 under former Prime Minister Theresa May in 2019 and was quick to build it up to renewable energy capacity. But campaigners have criticised the government's record in recent years. West Africa's regional bloc said a military intervention in the Honta ruled Niger was the last resort as Nigeria cut electricity supplies to intensify pressure on the country's coup leaders. And as ex-colonial power France sent in a fifth plane to evacuate its citizens, coup leader General Abu Jaman Titan insisted that had no reason to leave the country. The economic community of West African states sent a delegation to Niger on Wednesday to negotiate with the military coup leaders who seized power last week. Meanwhile, regional defense chiefs started a two-day meeting in the Nigerian capital Abuja. Abdel Fattah Moussa, ECOWAS's Commissioner for Political Affairs, Peace and Security. If we can avoid a peaceful resolution of the country, in the country, so forget, that is our preferred option. But we have to prepare for all eventualities. And uh, Excellencies, you are here for the final eventuality, the last resort. That is, planning for a possible intervention to restore constitutional order. ECOWAS has imposed sanctions on Niger and threatened to authorize the use of force if the coup leaders do not reinstate President Mohamed Bazoum by Sunday. The West African regional bloc has struggled to contain a democratic backslide in the region and had vowed that coups would no longer be tolerated after recent takeovers in Mali, Burkina Faso and Guinea. Mali and Burkina Faso have said that any military intervention in Niger would be considered a declaration of war against them too. 
ECOWAS has taken its hardest line yet on Niger, closing borders with the country, banning commercial flights, halting financial transactions, and cutting power supply. Niger is a key Western ally in the fight against Islamist insurgents. And the coup has been condemned by foreign powers who fear it could allow the militants to gain ground. Britain's Foreign Secretary James Cleverly met with Nigerian President Bola Tinubu in Abuja on Wednesday. I made the point that the UK very much welcomes uh, ECOWAS's and his indeed decisive uh, action, his strong commitment to democracy and the unambiguous message that violence is not the means to uh, bring political change uh, in, uh, uh, in any circumstance and that the commitment to democracy in, in Nigeria uh, and in the region is unwavering. This very much supports the UK's position. On tonight's segment on Road to the White House, a New York Times poll has found that U.S. President Joe Biden and former President Donald Trump are tied in a hypothetical 2024 rematch. Let's take a look. The newly released poll found that both Biden and Trump would receive 43% of the votes if the 2024 presidential election were held instantaneously. Both Trump and Biden have low approval ratings with 54% of respondents disapproving of Biden's handling of the presidency and 55% saying they have an unfavorable opinion of Trump. Both men are likely to win their respective parties' nominations, with 64% saying they would vote for Biden if the election for Democratic nominee or president were held. However, when asked about the reasons they would prefer someone other than Biden to be the Democratic Party's 2024 presidential nominee, 39% said age drove their decision and 20% said job performance. The New York Times Siena College poll released previously showed Trump receiving 54% support from Republican primary voters with Florida Governor Ron DeSantis at just 17%. Asked about the investigations into Trump, 51% of voters said Trump has committed serious federal crimes and 53% believe that his actions after the 2020 presidential election went so far that he threatened American democracy. In all, 49% of voters rated the economy as poor and 29% said it was only fair under Biden's watch. According to the survey, a 65% majority think the country is headed in the wrong direction. Governors Ron DeSantis and Gavin Newsom have tentatively agreed to debate, one hosted by Fox News. The Florida Republican and the California Democrat have repeatedly spared over policies in their respective states, each representing one side of the ideological spectrum through occupying different political bridges. DeSantis, a Republican, is trailing former President Donald Trump for the Republican presidential nomination, while Newsom, a Democrat, has brushed aside questions about his own presidential ambitions to become a super surrogate of sorts for President Joe Biden. A showdown between the two seemed unlikely as DeSantis sammed up his presidential campaign, but Newsom still has spent months trying to entice his counterpart into joining him on stage. Welcome back. Devastating typhoon Kalan has ripped through the Japanese island of Okinawa, knocking out electricity and forcing hundreds of flights to be cancelled. So far, one person has died and dozens are injured, while thousands of tourists remain stranded. Typhoon Kanun, which means jackfruit in Thai, slammed Okinawa and other islands in southwestern Japan Wednesday. Although moving slowly at roughly 15 kilometers per hour, its strong winds of up to 200 kilometers per hour left more than 200,000 households, roughly 31 percent of the city, without electricity. According to the local fire and disaster management agency, a man in his 90s died when his garage collapsed, while at least 35 people have been reported injured. Hundreds of domestic and international flights in and out of the Naha airport were canceled on Wednesday, stranding thousands of tourists. In public transportation, including buses, light rail transit systems, and ferries connecting the region's islands, were suspended. The agency also added that up to 200 millimeters of rainfall was expected in the Okinawa region by midday Thursday. 
The Japanese Meteorological Agency predicts the typhoon that's currently moving northwest through the East China Sea will turn northeastward by Friday, potentially heading to Japan's third largest island, Kyushu. Though the typhoon is not expected to approach the Korean peninsula, waves around Jeju Island are set to reach 4 to 6 meters, and the far seas of eastern Namhae will see waves 3 to 5 meters high. While Typhoon Kanun stalls in the East China Sea, the heat wave is expected to persist in Korea, as the typhoon adds more heat to the hot and humid air already blowing in from the North Pacific High and the Tibetan anticyclone. It will also bring strong winds for the southern part of the country and Jeju Island. In Brazil, at least 44 people have been killed in police raids targeting drug gangs across the three states. Police in Rio de Janeiro killed at least nine people in a raid on Wednesday, in the latest example of deadly violence by Brazil's security officials after 16 people died at the hands of Sao Paulo State Police earlier this week. But the operation was seized by Brazil's Justice Minister as being a disproportionate reaction to the original crime. The following visuals of this story is graphic. Viewer discretion is strictly advised. Police in Rio de Janeiro killed at least nine people in a raid on Wednesday. Authorities say officers were attacked by armed assailants during an operation in the city's Penha neighborhood. Nine of the alleged gangsters were killed, including two alleged gang leaders. And they say one officer was hospitalized adding they had seized seven rifles, ammunition and grenades from the suspects. Brazil has the highest number of murders in the world, as well as some of the planet's deadliest police. They regularly do battle with criminal groups in Brazil's poor working-class neighborhoods or favelas. Just earlier this week, 16 people died at the hands of Sao Paulo State Police after a policeman was shot dead, triggering protests in the city of Guarujá. We want to tell our public servants that we do not accept paying for the bullets that kills our children. Sao Paulo's governor said accusations of excessive force would be investigated, but also described the deaths as the inevitable, quote, collateral effects of fighting crime. Lopsided death tolls have become a common occurrence in Rio raids, leading critics to allege excessive force or even summary executions by the police. In 2021, at least 29 people died in an operation in a Rio slum, while only one police officer lost his life. Police killings rose in Rio during the presidency of former far-right President Jair Bolsonaro, who sought to boost legal protections for police who kill on the job, and said criminals should, quote, die like cockroaches. That stance has long been criticized by current president Luis Inácio Lula da Silva, who beat Bolsonaro in last year's vote. Over in the UK, the National Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Children has raised concerns about the children who were killed during lockdown restrictions between 2020 and 2021, as the silent crisis of child abuse in the pandemic era went largely unaddressed. These are some of the other children killed in their family homes, hidden behind doors that were closed because of the COVID lockdown. Clearly, the eyes and ears of services weren't on the most vulnerable children in our society. So practitioners, frontline staff weren't able to see children as they would routinely do so. And neither were community members. So their children were behind closed doors. And, and if home was a violent one, then they certainly weren't safeguarded or protected from, from the people that wished to do them harm. Government figures for reports of death and harm to children during lockdown, where abuse of neglect was known or suspected, showed a marked rise. There were a total of 536 serious incident notifications, a rise of 19% on the previous pre-COVID year. 223 of the reports related to child deaths, 191 related to children under a year old. In Solihull, six-year-old Arthur Labinjo Hughes was starved and beaten, 130 bruises and a fatal brain injury. Police and social workers failed to intervene. Arthur's stepmother was jailed for murder, his father for manslaughter. In West Yorkshire, toddler Star Hobson, catastrophic injuries from punches and kicks. Her mother guilty of allowing her death, her partner convicted of murder. In Derbyshire, Baby Finlay Bowden died with 57 broken bones. 
a court heard of his prolonged, savage and sadistic murder at the hands of his parents. That's an issue too for the current independent Covid inquiry. It's examining planning, the political decisions taken, their impact and lessons for another pandemic. Now, the first time in Korea, a drone delivery service has been introduced in an urban area. The service in Seongdam City, Jeongdong-do province, targets visitors of the city's water parks. Let's take a closer look at what's unique about this drone service. Drone delivery services have previously been trialled in remote mountainous areas. But now they are a step closer to being commercialised in densely populated urban areas. Starting from August, Seongnam City in Gyeonggi-do province has become the first urban area in South Korea to launch paid drone delivery services. From August, it started the service at two water parks along the Tanchun stream. When a customer places an order, a drone delivers the items from a delivery hub 1.7 kilometers away and completes the delivery within five minutes. Various items can be delivered ranging from fried chicken and beverages to water play equipment. I don't find the drone delivery fee too expensive because the cost of other general deliveries is similar to or even higher than this. It's surprisingly fast and I use the service frequently. There are many regulations related to drones such as altitude restrictions, making it difficult to introduce drone delivery services in urban areas. Through this paid service, the drone company and the city is aiming to overcome these challenges. We are in the process of proving the safety of the drones through thousands of trials. This will allow us to deliver to areas including crowded cities. We are working with the transport ministry to improve public perception through paid services. The service is a part of the transport ministry's efforts to establish a standardized model for drone delivery in accordance with the country's economic development blueprint called the New Growth 4.0 Strategy. Starting September, we will expand the drone delivery service to multiple locations. Our goal is to give people first-hand experience of cutting-edge technologies. We expect that it will make a significant contribution to the development of flying drone taxi services. The Ministry of Land, Infrastructure and Transport is planning to commercialize drone delivery service by 2027 while doubling the size of the country's drone market to 1 trillion current won or over 770 million US dollars by 2025 from 2020. Welcome back. For more news, let's take care on the world in a minute. A WMO update that combined forecasts and expert guidance from around the world said that there is a 90% probability of the El Nino event continuing during the second half of 2023, and it is expected to be at least of moderate strength. China successfully launched a new meteorological satellite. The satellite will provide services with weather forecasting, atmospheric chemistry studying and climate change monitoring and research. Heavy rainfall caused a flash flood and mudslide in Thailand's northern Mae Hong Song province, sweeping away 12 houses and killing one person in Sobmo district. According to the latest integrated food security phase projections, over 20.3 million people across Sudan are experiencing high levels of acute food insecurity between July and September this year with 14 million facing a food crisis and 6.3 million in a more critical food emergency. Hundreds of scout participants at Global Scout Jamboree in South Korea have suffered the heat exhaustion, prompting organizers to scramble for safety measures. That is all we have for you on World News tonight. If you miss any of today's programs, you can always rewatch by catching us on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash English. We leave you tonight in Wellington, where the weather workshop is taking soccer fans on a journey back to Middle Earth and etheral themselves in the world of Lord of the Rings. Thank you for watching. Good night.